<laughs> That's <laughs> That's <great. good> <laughs> so, so uh, zero trust, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, refresh my memory again. What is the background for, you know, I'm, I'm sharing my thoughts on zero trust that I know, but there's an event or something coming up. And right. So we have, we're doing a round table or panel discussion, panel discussion next week. And uh, Priyanka is going to be moderating it. And we've got a real variety of participants from encryption to identity management to GitLab. And, and I thought the, a good common denominator among such a diverse group would be zero trust. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's kind of the, um, the galvanizing discussion or question that, uh, that we'll focus on. Priyanka, feel free to. Yeah. So yeah, Cindy came up with this really good concept because it like brings us all together, like very diverse people. And so at this point, it's the theme of the entire event. <laughs> and so it's a GitLab Connect day. Um, and traditionally, I think this is these GitLab days are just like you know sales people and their prospects and a few and some GitLab speaking. But this one's different. We are going to actually host it at. General Catalyst office in San Francisco, and they're like a pretty well-respected uh, investor, Steve Herod. He's gonna do uh, like opening remarks, and uh, then Jim Zemlin, who's the head of the Linux Foundation, is going to do a lightning talk, uh, and then followed by the panel. And at this point, uh, Emily and I are telling Jim, Steve, everyone that hey, the theme of the event is zero trust, and so let's like you know all kind of connect on that. Now, one thing that I think would be really helpful to know in ad addition to like the concepts of zero trust is just how um, we at GitLab as the product suite can maybe advance people who are, uh, help people who are trying to go in that direction or like doing things that operate in a zero trust way. I don't even know if I'm saying it the right way, but I wanna in my head connect the zero trust philosophy and the GitLab product suite, if we can, just so I have that link established. Yeah, so um, to take a couple steps back when, when Cindy listed the topics uh, all the way from encryption to AppSec to, you know, um, other topics, probably zero trust wasn't the first thing that popped up for me in terms of a common denominator. Mm -hmm. um, because the reason for that is because right now, very, very few companies have successfully or even started implementing zero trust. Okay, okay. Um, if you look at like the cloud native companies out there, yeah. only 20% have implemented zero trust. And the reason for that low number is not because people are not aware or don't wanna do it, it's because it requires a certain amount of um, awareness and also the right environment to successfully implement it. So if you're a very, very large enterprise company, or let, let's say you're a bank, right, with a lot of legacy system and with a lot of physical um, brick and mortar, you know, buildings and um, people coming into a physical location or VPNing into a a particular subnet first before getting access, it can be really hard to take that paradigm and translate it over to zero trust. Okay. Um, so I talked to a lot of people about where they are with building zero trust. And right now, more than 50% of the time, I get, wow, I would love to be there. Uh, we are, it's going to take us a really long time. Uh, and, and first, our culture has to change. That happens as well. Um, yeah. So GitLab, in many ways, is an ideal environment to implement zero trust. Okay. And that's because we're 100% remote. There's no physical office. Everything is hosted in a cloud environment, right? Even our third-party products that we use are in other SaaS environments. Um, there is no local data center that we maintain, right? We, we don't run our own data centers. Um, many places do. So there, when you do that, you're 
responsible for setting up all the physical assets in there and mm -hmm. physical security comes into it as well. We don't have that, right? So um, all we have to do is look at the, the GCP environment, for example, and say, okay, how many assets do we have there? What is the classification of the sensitivity of data stored or processed on each of those assets? And let's prioritize. So um, our focus should be on creating a boundary around every single host in that environment. Um, and then making a risk-based decision when someone tries to access that endpoint um, on whether they should be allowed access or not based on who they are, what their needs are for accessing that level of sensitive data, and um, what the state of the device that they're using to access this data. Is it up to date on all the patches? Does it have GitLab? Um, is it a GitLab-owned hardware that has endpoint management on it? Um, if it is, and they are on a team that is supposed to have access to that data, um, then yeah, we allow access. But if they don't fit those criteria, we deny access. That's, that's fundamentally how zero trust works. Okay. Okay, so um, a lot of environments are not ready for that. That's why they haven't rolled it out. I see. Okay, so this sounds like, from a narrative perspective, it sounds a little bit like where we were with um, DevOps maybe two, three years ago where people were like, oh, we love the idea of it and the possibilities, but we have such silo developer and operation organizations are like the way we do software development is so like not conducive to DevOps that we're like, just it's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. So would you agree that that is similar and maybe we can expect the same kind of movement in the industry for uh, zero trust as well? Um, I expect zero trust will become more and more of a hot topic and a pressing initiative for many CISOs mm -hmm. over the next five years. Um, right now, it seems to me that the trend for going with zero trust is just starting to build. It's you know, earlier. Yeah. Um, 451 just did a, a webinar yesterday on key trends and forecasts for 2019. Mm -hmm. And zero trust trust was one of the five key trends. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So all of the analyst um, firms are well aware. Uh, and to be honest, zero trust is not a new concept, right? That's that exactly what Philippe was saying. And I was going to ask that because his, I ch chatted with him, I think yesterday. Yeah. And he was like, well, it's not a new concept. And like we're all kind of in some way maybe doing it or, or, or and like that was his perspective. So how, what do you think of that? Um, so it isn't a new concept because back in the mid 2000s, uh, there was a, a group called the Jericho Forum. And during one of their meetings, there was a topic of, look, we're all doing security in a way that makes it easy for the attacker once they break through the perimeter. So we, we put as many defenses as we can on the perimeter of our network. And then let's say that's a firewall or some other device. But once they break in through there and they get access to the inside of the perimeter, it's really easy for them to move from one host to another and to gain access to data that they shouldn't have access to. Um, so what can we do differently to counter that paradigm? And the thought process was, you know, what if we treated the perimeter as a non-entity? Let's say that we don't care about the perimeter. There's no perimeter to break into. Every right. single host inside this environment should have its own perimeter, right? So now there's no one perimeter to break into to get access to a whole bunch of uh, yeah. hosts, right? For every host you want to try to get to, you got to re-authenticate and re-authorize. Right. Um, so okay. that makes it very um, hard for an attacker who, for example, steals someone's passwords. So, okay, so I've got your account login and your passwords. So what? I still have to authenticate for every system. Right. Like maybe you don't have access to that system. 
right? So, so um, then identity and, management is a big part of the zero trust thing. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the most famous example of a, a company that has, has implemented zero trust and they're not even done is Google. Mm -hmm. Right. So like back in 2010, 11 timeframe, Google had a massive breach. Okay. Um, the Gmail was breached and um, it was done by a nation state adversary. Right. So very sophisticated, very big. Um, so after that, they rolled out what they call Beyond Corp, which right. is their term for zero trust. But it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. um, so they rolled that out, wrote a series of white papers, which you can go and read about if you just Google Beyond Corp, it's okay. there. Um, yeah. But they were probably the most prominent company to implement it back in 2011. Gotcha. Um, okay. My understanding is they're not done. They're still doing it now. Right. Right. So it's, it's a big effort, huge effort. But I think uh, that so. lends itself to the to the comparison with DevOps because nobody's really done with DevOps either. I mean, it's a journey, right? It's, it's, it's a journey. Uh, it's a process. To, yeah. But I think that, um, I think with the diminished perimeter and with cloud, the, I, there are some things that become bigger and more important identity management, application security, um, data encryption, being able to, encapsulate those you know the data and the and the logic around it um to better protect those and so i that's where i was coming at with those are kind of the common denominators among this really diverse group um in terms of i, I think it's good to ask their perspective of zero trust is becoming a bigger issue we can we can point to the 451 research that says you know it's the they're saying it's the big thing for the year, right? And so what does that mean? What, is, what does that mean for each company and from each perspective? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll also cite another example of why zero trust is so hard for most companies to build. There isn't a single commercial off the shelf product yeah. that you can buy today that will slap zero trust into your network. That's not how that works, right? <laughs> It's a process and it's custom depending on what your environment looks like. Everyone has a different environment. Um, it's dependent on your organization as well. Like how do you decide who gets access to what data in your organization? That could be different across multiple companies. Um, it's, it's also about whether you process and store other customer data in your environment. If you do, then you've got more problems to worry about as well. So, you know, there's a, a lot of considerations that come into how you would even implement zero trust in your network. And that's why there isn't a vendor product right. that you just buy and slap in and now you've got zero trust. That's not, you know. I have a question. Um, we're all agreeing zero trust work in progress. People are just starting to think about it. What is the status quo? Just so because I like I've I've internalized the zero trust story a bit more now, but I have no idea where where were we before? Where were we, GitLab or no, where like were... the industry? Oh, the industry. Uh, it depends on the sector, really. Okay. Okay. Um, probably the most forward thinking sectors would be the cloud native companies. Right. By necessity, they're already uh, more modernized. Their systems yeah. tend to be you know, more up to date and they have to rely on using uh, cloud services of a major mm -hmm. provider like Google mm -hmm. or AWS or you know, um, mm -hmm. Azure. And that forces you to think differently than if you operated your own data center, set up your own physical yeah. servers and decided what to install and all that. Right. It sounds very connected to whether you're in on the cloud computing trend or not. Mm -hmm. Like if you're yeah. using uh, your own, if you have your own server farms or whatever, then it because, sounds because it becomes more important when you don't have that perimeter that you can protect. So the traditional yeah. non-zero trust sort of approach was I've got a, a data center that I can put, you know, 
protections around. I've got a network. I'm going to look at the network traffic and stop any mm -hmm. network traffic that I don't trust. The, it's, um, it's very different when you think of porting your application and, and you've got now with containers and Kubernetes, you can take that application and you can run it anywhere. You can run it on AWS. You can move it to, to Azure. It makes it very portable. So you have to think about, I don't have that physical perimeter anymore. You don't have right. the perimeter, so what are you going to protect? Okay. Yeah, so the kind of um, corporate entity that would be the opposite of what we are at GitLab would be a large bank, for example, that has their own physical facility, and they do everything on-prem, and they don't go with any cloud services because they host their own uh, environment. They, you know, make people VPN into that environment to then connect to other uh, data systems. And then also, if they were even to use a third-party product like Salesforce or anything else that we or use, it, it, it would all be on-prem. They would maintain that themselves. They wouldn't put it on someone else's SaaS environment. So, okay. so but, that paradigm is the opposite of what we are. Understood. But, but Kathy, so. I would argue that even that one's changing because people are doing private clouds in order to use their resource pool better. Right, but the private clouds are still being maintained by them. Right, right. So, but, but it still represents another potential attack vector. That of course, can. of course. There's always a task vector, no matter what you do. Uh, even, even zero trust isn't 100% secure. Sure. Uh, but what we're talking about is raising the bar so that it's more challenging and it takes more resources and time for the attacker. So and the whole- And you detect them before they get to something sensitive. That's also part of it, right? Like if they get in here, they're as subtle as an elephant marching across the room, that doesn't help them either, right? right. So right. Um, the ability for them to persist in our environment is very important. Once they, uh, the attack vector typically is break in and then persist and wait and then do other things right in the background. I so see. if they're not able to do that successfully, it's not worth their time. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. I see. So now I have a very naive question. Don't laugh at me, you both. Um, do people do this a lot? Like, I don't understand why people would attack systems. Like, I don't. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, just some, um, stealing data about right. maybe your customers or maybe stealing your intellectual property, right? There's okay. a lot of reasons for people. Also, there's uh, cyber crimes, right? Uh, okay. Financial gain, that sort of thing. So it so depends how, on... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You were saying how often? Yeah, like how often does this happen or is this more like an insurance policy for something that happens once in five years, once every year or like every day we're seeing something? This happens every day. Really? Wow. Yeah. Every single Fortune 500 company in the United States has already been breached at least once. Wow. And yeah. I can send you some, I was putting together some more recent um, attacks on that were cloud or Kubernetes based or container or Kubernetes based. Um, and yeah. the, the other aspect is with GDPR in, in Europe, yes. um, the consequences can be, can like take your company out. Mm -hmm. Yep. There can be a company oh, extinction yeah. level type of event with a breach. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Yeah. And so it's like, basically people are having to fight criminals on their own. Like there is no like police force here. You have to have your own, like. Kathy, you, you and your team are our police force, right? Effectively? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We're the first line of defense, right? right. So, wow. yeah. That is so crazy when you think about it, right? Because in the physical world, there, there is like a public utility of someone's going to help you if you get robbed. And they're not going to tell you now you don't get to own a house. But that's kind of what it sounds like happens. Well, um, there are processes in place for us that we're a U.S.-based company. Mm -hmm. um, GitLab Inc. is based in the U.S. So because of that, if someone attacks GitLab.com, and we have evidence of that, uh, yes. we can contact, I mean, I have contact at the FBI that I can reach out to, and they will conduct the investigation 
and okay. prosecute if they, you know, discover who it is. Uh, launched it. Assuming that they have jurisdiction in wherever the, the attack originated from, right? So, okay. Yeah, I, if it originated from Russia or China or whatever, they have no jurisdiction there, right? So, so we can't do anything then? No. That's why there's so much incentive for these attackers to, to act. There needs to be like a TV show about this. This is like really cool. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a really good one called Mr. Robot. You should oh. watch it. <laughs> I didn't realize it was about this stuff. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So that was cool. probably one of the best in terms of being realistic. Okay, I'm gonna, now I didn't know what Mr. Robot was about and I was like, what's the fuss? Yeah, yeah it. check it out. Now I get it. Okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a good book too called Cyberstorm. Okay. That, uh, okay, it's on my list. I love like, like crime. <laughs> Not like to do it, but <laughs> like show it. Um, I've liked all the books that have been written by Mark Rosinovich. Um, he's, he's a former Sys internal tool developer at Microsoft. But he retired and decided to write cybersecurity novels. Um, he has really good ones. Yeah. What? Mark Rusinovich. R U S S I N O V I C H. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. So cool. <laughs> this is like great. This new world has opened up to me. I was just gonna go learn something about security and now I'm like, this is way cooler than cloud native. <laughs> <laughs> we reeled you in. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> this is awesome. Cool. Okay. Th this helps a lot. Thank you. And so last question. Sorry, I'm asking so many. Um, GitLab as the company, we, uh, when, when you joined the company, were we already kind of thinking zero trust because like we're always, like we have all these clouds. So, okay. So we always were like this. Um, so when I first joined GitLab, I was a team of one for two months at the beginning, right? Yeah. And had to build up a team, which we have an awesome team now, and still hiring more people. But, you know, with a team of one, you really can't build a lot, right? It's, you're wearing a lot of different hats. Um, yes. But zero trust is something that um, came on our radar because we have to think more proactively about how to do defense in depth than how GitLab was doing it before I came okay. on board. So um, this was not something GitLab was already planning before I came on board, but afterwards, one of the first things I set out to do was uh, fix the security mitigation process so nice. that we can start fixing our vulnerabilities faster. Um, Correct, and, okay. Yeah. Um, and then this is part of the plan to proactively build out a defense in depth mechanism before we have a major breach here. Because of the 20% of cloud native companies that have built out zero trust, almost all of them did it after a major breach. Mm, yes. So I'm trying to get us ahead of that. <laughs> right, right. And build this out before uh, a major breach. Got it. Okay. And um, do we use any of the GitLab secure and defend products for GitLab? Well, so defend is still very much in progress. Yeah. Um, yes. We haven't really put together a formal team for that yet. Mm -hmm. So that's still going on for secure for scanning. Uh, we definitely want to dog food it and I'm working with Philippe to make sure we get looped in to do that. Right now, I need them to, um, we, we can't, we don't have the cycles to keep going over and looking at scan right. results. So what I want is an automated process where the scan results get added to a GitLab issue and then the security team gets tagged in the issue to go gotcha. review. So we can work with that, but just to go in and look at every result right. manually yeah. is, is hard for us. Totally, okay. So that's yeah. what you need as a customer. From. Yes, that's what we need as a customer. And that's what our customers would want, right? So, right, right. It, it yeah. aligns with you now. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Super helpful. Thank you. Cool. Um, anything else like you folks recommend I should know about or like, you know, 
to hide my complete ignorance. So I'll be upfront. I'll be like, <laughs> I am not the expert in this room. I am just excited by Mr. Robot and <laughs> own defender Kathy and Cindy. I'll be upfront about it, but I think this prepares me to have at least like you know some understanding, and I think I'll be able to like foment a good discussion. Um, so I'm I'm really grateful for all this effort from. Both. Yeah. So uh, Priyanka, I would just recommend um, if you're moderating, a yeah. really good question to ask is yeah. always what are the top one or two challenges that you face as head of security, right? Okay. Because got that's got to be, um, for most people, it's going to be, I, I'm worried about a breach or I'm worried about, you know, um, that we don't, we have all these vulnerabilities in our applications that we don't know about. Um, that's what most people are worried about. So that is a great lead in for you to talk about apps up about zero trust. And, you know, right. That's and, a great idea. Yeah. Uh, all the panelists have a security like offering, but I'll turn it on them and kind of be like, what's your security concerns? Right. Yeah. Exactly. That, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Cool. All right. all right. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for setting this up, Cindy. Also appreciate it. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. All right. Let me know if you have any.